opportunity. I'll start again because there was a recording announcement <laughs> of thanking audience members and particularly our authors as well as the Center for Progressive Reform for sponsoring this wonderful opportunity to dig into a book that I first encountered in draft form and have lived with with delight um, over the past several months. How Government Built America by Sid Shapiro and Joe Tomain is an absolute marvel of a reconstruction of something we have lost our way about. And that's the role that government has played in partnering with our market economy, with markets to build the United States across its history. Um, emphasis here is on partnering and we're gonna spend a lot of time on um, where we've lost our way in understanding that partnership and how it in fact has been manifest after all. I thought we'd begin though by asking Sid and Joe to say just a few words about themselves, let them introduce themselves to us all. And also after they've briefly described their background and relevance for this mighty work. What was the inspiration for this particular book? Um, thanks, Rogan. And um, as you just heard, um, Rogan was not only involved in some of the drafting, but uh, was uh, a wonderful reader and uh, muse as, I, uh, as we worked through this uh, work. Um, I'm Sid Shapiro and um, Joe and I, uh, as he'll tell you as well, um, have been writing and thinking and teaching about government and regulation for, well, a long time. You can, you, you can see the gray hair. Um, and um, our inspiration for the book is sort of summed up uh, in um, what happened to us uh, about a decade ago when we were working on our previous book. Um, and in the introduction to the book, we tell the story that we were in Asheville with our spouses uh, to work on uh, our previous book. Um, and they had gone off during the day, we worked on the book, and then the bed and breakfast had a um, uh, cocktail hour, wine and cheese, about four o'clock, five o'clock, we went down. And just as we entered the room, uh, one of the other men of a couple was railing about government. Government's bad this, government's bad that, and uh, my reaction in that situation is um, just not say anything. Uh, those aren't productive conversations. I probably wasn't going to change his mind. Um, Joe is braver than I am. Um, he looked at him and said, do you like your insurance company? That um, propelled us towards this book. The sort of common misunderstanding among uh, people uh, that um, somehow government is this exception, uh, an unfortunate exception to uh, the market economy without really thinking through that markets uh, themselves have limitations and uh, are not going to be able to achieve what we want for this country on their own. So my name Joe, is- You want to add to that? Uh, I, I'll elaborate a little bit, Sid. Um, my name is Joe Tomain and I, uh, as Sid has said, have been doing this for some time and I'm at the University of Cincinnati um, Sid and I wrote our first joint project together 30 years ago, and it was called Regulatory Law and Policy. It was a case book. Uh, and at the time, I don't think either of us, Sid, correct me if I, if I misstate your position, I don't think either of us thought that it was controversial that we had something called an administrative state. That phrase was not in vogue. Uh, nor do I think it was controversial that the government played an important role in our lives. We were just chronicling uh, how the administrative state works in that book. Let's fast forward uh, to 2014. Sid referenced an earlier book that we wrote together called Achieving Democracy, uh, uh, the, the Future of Progressive Reform, and that was written in 2014. Uh, the next to the last year of Obama's uh, two terms in office. Uh, that book uh, made the bold idea, uh, pronouncement that it looks like we've taken a turn away from the neoliberalism that existed for the previous 30 or 40 years towards a, role, uh, towards a period in which government played a more active role. That was 2014. Then 2016 happens, and we're throwing this huge curveball uh, of the Trump administration, 
uh, a big movement right. Uh, and then the question is, well, wait a minute, can we move away uh, from the uh, uh, from uh, the us versus them thinking, the polarization, and sort of look more closely at what government actually has done for us over its history. Hence, that our book, uh, How Government Built America. Wonderfully described, and thank you for that. I'm sorry, Joe, but no matter how many wonderful case books and books you write, the administrative state as a term will never be in vogue <laughs> widely in the U.S. Very sad, but <laughs> True. As, as, a, as a fan of it and teacher of it myself, um, that's a lost hope. So this is not an anti-markets book. Throughout the book, for example, in chapter four, you note that the, quote, genius of markets in creating economic progress and prosperity was on full display. You're talking at that point about the Industrial Revolution. Markets are vital. We see that in every chapter and on virtually every page. And you want to remind us, markets can also be destructive. At a moment when the vast majority of the population, especially people over 35, essentially celebrate the genius, could you remind us of a few examples or a, even a general theory of ways in which markets can sometimes harm and even fail we the people of the United States of America? Joe, oh, you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think there's some very obvious examples. I mean, pollution being the biggest one. Uh, you know, I like this idea uh, that a lot of people have written about climate change is it's the world's biggest market failure. Uh, and that's a really a very interesting way to, to, to look at it. So pollution would be one, monopoly would be another. And I think that one of the biggest challenges we're facing today, uh, it's amplified by artificial intelligence, uh, is just how reliable uh, is advertising? How reliable are political commentary? So we're really dealing with a situation in which information and the social media and the, and the regular media that we rely on may in fact not contain, uh, as I said, reliable information and it contains instead misinformation and disinformation, That's, which is a market failure. I think the other thing we'd like readers to understand um, is that um, the question is not markets, not markets. Markets is the center of public policy. Um, the question really starts with government because government makes that decision. Uh, government decides uh, through democracy, we the voters, uh, the extent to which we're going to have markets and we're going to regulate them or otherwise intervene in them. And hence, uh, the question is the mix. What mix is most appropriate? And as Joe pointed out, markets can fail easily. And then we, the people, through the government, uh, will make some decision about um, reacting to that and changing uh, the mix. But um, there also has to be a goal. What are we achieving uh, through making these issues about the mix? What, what are we going to accomplish? And um, that's where I think our book makes uh, maybe a, a fairly unique point that got lost. It's not unique. Others have made it, but it's certainly gotten lost, um, which is the goal of government is to achieve the national values of the country. Uh, and we define those it can be variously defined as liberty, equality, fairness, and the public interest. And uh, as Joe was pointing out, sometimes markets go awry um, and when they do, they threaten some of those values and government can make a correction. Other times, markets just ignore those values and you need government to reintroduce them. So that's that's where um, we see uh, the discussion should be about uh, in public policy. Uh, let me just add two quick points. I, I've always sort of my teeth rankle when I hear the phrase free market because there is no such thing. It's made up. Uh, what we should be saying instead of free market is competitive markets. That's what we like in capitalism is competitive markets. And an ancillary point is that markets are not self-correcting. We've seen that over and over again. So two really wonderful descriptors of ways in which, again, I, re, listeners here and readers of your book who 
logged on to listen to a bunch of progressives talk about how bad markets are will be very disappointed <laughs> because this is not a book that makes that point. I do want to stay on a point you both raised and I'll, to do so, I'll go back a little farther than 2014 to probably 1983 or so when Ronald Reagan for the first time um, of many delivered his quip that the most terrifying words in English are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, and yet, as your book makes clear throughout, the government has helped. And both Sid and Joe just gave examples of how, I'll come back to the question of how the government's been helpful and how it can be, but how did the United States' national narrative lose sight of the government as helpful? Our institutions of government have, by Gallup's annual poll, never been so negatively viewed by a vast majority of the population. 8% of Americans view our national legislature, their elective body they're closest to, the Congress, 8% approve of the U.S. Congress. More Americans approve of toenail fungus than that. <laughs> we lose our sight of government as helpful. What happened? Um, I think there are two answers to that. Uh, and I, I'll, one is uh, what government does and accomplish is sometimes hard to see. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful book about um, the 1800s and the Jackson Jacksonian era when uh, there was so the sort of belief is uh, there wasn't much government going on. And uh, there was, there was a lot. It was just invisible. Um, but uh, the more immediate answer, given um, the dates you prescribed, um, is that um, government let people down um, and, um, and it continues to do so. And I think that's the source of a lot of the polarization and certainly distrust of institutions. Um, so we got this wonderful market system um, and it led us to globalization. Globalization is a good thing for countries. Um, and the United States uh, has benefited tremendously. It's driven up our wealth of the country greatly. Um, but um, that wealth has been uh, only distributed to the certain parts of the economy that benefited greatly from globalization. Um, and um, the other parts, um, particularly the industrial parts, have not. Um, and we could have had government policies that um, shared the wealth. Uh, and built a new market economy around a fairer um, and more equitable system. And we failed to do that. And people have lost faith uh, in that. Uh, and I think that continues to haunt us. Uh, so uh, we, we do say in our book um, that we don't idealize government. <laughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And this is one instance of where um, democracy failed us. Yeah, I would. Uh, Sid pretty much uh, uh, has expressed my sentiments. I think a lot of the antagonism towards the government, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it isn't because there's too much government. It's that it's not enough. Well said. So markets, again, that can be, you use the word genius in some places in terms of creating economic progress, um, government, also um, poignantly said, has failed us. Um, and I also appreciate the point you made, Sid, about government can be hard to see. There's a wonderful recent work by a political scientist um, at Cornell named Suzanne Mettler called The Submer Submerged State, where a huge amount of what government does that's enormously beneficial is hidden in ways that citizens who are benefiting from government programs and the like cannot see because it's through the things like the tax code. You know, huge number of anti-government people get enormous tax breaks for owning a home. They don't see that as a government benefit when, of course, it is, et cetera. Talk, as you do so eloquently in the book, about ways in which, or examples, if you like, of how the government has been helpful in maintaining this mix, as you say, and enhancing things like economic prosperity and protecting we the people. Let me, uh, let me give you... Two quick examples, and then Sid could add to them. I'd say the GI Bill it was is absolutely a remarkable uh, contribution uh, to to the United States, uh, and then uh, in the incredible amount of investments we've made in science and technology. I mean, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have cell phones without government uh, uh, innovation. Great concrete examples, both. I will ask you for. Any webinar attendees who are under, say, 35 or 40, say two words about the GI Bill and what it did. Go ahead, Sid. 
Um, so let me preface that by saying uh, one of the quotes that we ran across um, that um, continues to just, I think, be a centerpiece of how we think about government was um, Abraham uh, Lincoln's uh, quote. Uh, he's famous for saying government exists to do things for people which they can't do for themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a less famous quote where he defined uh, the role of government, at least in markets, as creating a fair chance in the race of life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the GI Bill is one of those instances, more broadly, public education. So we stress in the book, uh, going back to the long history of public education, the colonies, uh, going through the 1700s, 1800s, the development of colleges, um, that um, we provide, uh, or at least did, uh, um, free public education, uh, one of the first countries to have um, a fairly educated uh, citizenry, first to have universal high school. Um, and that very much fits uh, Lincoln's notion that the role of government is to give people a fair chance. And then it's sort of up to them. Um, and uh, the GI Bill sort of backed into that. Um, the problem that the Roosevelt administration faced uh, after the war uh, is my father, uh, Joe's father, and lots of other uh, servicemen were coming home and the economy couldn't absorb them. So they had to decide, uh, what are we going to do with these 15, 20 million soldiers that are coming mm. home? And what they decided was that uh, they would um, either um, invest in their college education um, or uh, help them start a business or a trade school. Um, so college went from being a fairly elite uh, occasion among the American public, um, Rogan, you know this better than I, but 10, 12% of the public is the figure um, that I'm remembering, to uh, vast hordes of people uh, still today uh, get a college education. Um, and by energizing and training and, and uh, educating that generation, they propelled the United States into its most fabulous uh, growth period following the war uh, and maintain the growth started by the war uh, ever. And most importantly, that the 1950s had the most economic equality of any time in our history. Uh, nowadays, by the way, we have the least. Uh, you know, I love uh, Sid's uh, reference to Lincoln and the fair uh, chance in the race of life. Those are those sentiments were also uh, echoed by LBJ when he gave a commencement speech at Howard in 1965 in June, just before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, using almost the exact same language. One of the themes of the book is that these things are recurring. These aren't, everything that happens isn't new, you know? Uh, we have to correct markets when they go out of kilter. Uh, we have to protect people who can't help themselves. And those are themes that run throughout throughout our history. Uh, and uh, I think it's nicely exemplified by the, this uh, the, this connection between LBJ and Lincoln. A wonderful juxtaposition. And it reminds me that there's lots of possible ways you could have developed the rich argument at the center of this book. Political, legal, economic theory, you could have had a bunch of charts and tables like us empirical social scientists, you could have given us a whole set of legal precedents, in other words, court cases. Instead, you chose what I would say is a much more engaging approach. You tell this story of the changing and recurring, as Joe's just reminded us, mix of government and market through a series of historical figures, many of them famous, Abraham Lincoln, you just heard about John Lewis, FDR, and several of them less known, Ida Tarbell, Herbert Crowley, Alfred Kahn. Each of these figures comes to exemplify, again, a sort of particular era's new version of the government market mix with hearkening back to what's past. Would you talk about the choice you made to approach that way as authors and maybe give us an illustrative figure or two? Well, the, uh, let me let me take a, a first crack at that, Sid. I mean, I think one of the things that compelled us to move to mix make the mix, if you will, uh, as wide as it is, is it would have been so easy to name each chapter after a president. It would have been just too easy, uh, and so we thought, well, wait a minute, let's really uh, dig down and say, well, wait a minute, democracy is broader than 
presidential leadership. Democracy really does depend upon uh, what contributions individual citizens can make, uh, as well as members of different branches of the government. So we hit the legislature, we hit the executive, we hit the judiciary, uh, but there, there are civil servants and non-civil servants that also have contributed to our understanding of the mix. And Brogan, thank you for naming the ones you did, because I, I love this, the, the Tar Bell uh, reference and Crawley reference in particular. Um, for us, the, the figures we chose, we could have chosen many others as well, um, are emblematic of how change occurs in the country because they were instrumental in their time in um, obtaining a change in the mix, um, generally towards more government, but Ronald Reagan took us the other way, um, by talking about American values and the state of the country vis-a-vis uh, -vis those values. Um, and as the country changed, uh, as the economy changed, uh, as changes were necessary, they explained and um, campaigned and were activists around uh, what those changes meant for the country. Uh, and that's that's how change occurs. Um, uh, not only famous people doing it, but less famous people doing it. You know, I want to uh, underscore something you said, Sid. Um, we keep talking about the mix between government and markets, uh, that it's always been there. It's never been all government. It's never been all markets. That's not who we are as a country. Uh, and so the question then is, how do we know when the mix is a good one? I didn't say best. I didn't say perfect. But how do we know whether the mix is a good mix? That's, I think, where we introduce the concept of democratic values, and I mean small d, right? We know the mix is good if it promotes equality. We know the mix is good if it promotes liberty. If it retards either of those things, then the mix is out of balance. And I so to me, that's where we link the, these two ideas of the, uh, the political economy and our country's historic political and constitutional values. Well said. And um, I, again, I really appreciated learning about some characters I didn't know much about as well as seeing some familiar faces described. And I, I've got to say, I can't resist. Tell us how three of your figures, the three most recent, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and Anthony Fauci, <laughs> drive change, as Sid said, and, and or how do they exemplify together the time we're in right now? Uh, Joe, do you want Trump or Fauci? <laughs> yeah, thank, yeah thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the handoff. <laughs> you know, Trump is an outlier as far as I'm concerned. I, I think he has a complete disregard for uh, government and a disregard for the mix. And we try not to be as as bold as saying that in the book, we wanted to be a little bit more measured. Uh, I think what Biden does is he, I think he goes further than anyone, maybe since uh, FDR, uh, in realizing that investment in the American economy uh, really can right size the economy in ways that it needs to be done. I think he may have even go further uh, than LBJ's Great Society programming in many ways. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, the Bipartisan uh, uh, Investment Act, and things of that nature. Uh, so I think Biden really takes us to a time uh, where government really must play a central role. Oh, and by the way, Republicans voted for this too. Uh, the irony, the irony here is that they uh, continue to assail Biden, uh, but when they go back home, they claim uh, they claim they brought benefits to their state. So. Uh, hypocrisy aside. Mm. Uh, Fauci, he's a civil servant. Uh, we start the book, literally, I think it's the first sentence of the book, where we say both of us grew up when we thought government service was a noble thing to do. I can't think of a more noble public servant than Anthony Fauci right now. The, the thing about Trump that caught our attention uh, is put in this wider perspective of the book. Um, if we've had this long historical conversation about, um, you know, what should the mix be? And as Joe said, um, we decide that by trying to determine as best we can whether the mix is serving the, the values of the country or is contradicting uh, them. 
Um, but change doesn't happen easily. Uh, there are lots of obstacles, as um, any political scientist, including the one moderating this uh, webinar, will um, tell you. Um, and one of the things that happens, uh, uh, and Trump is a very good example, it seems to me, is that conversation gets derailed. Um, it goes off into uh, uh, social issues. Uh, it goes off into animus, my team versus your team. Um, and uh, whether it's today's, um, everybody's talking about social issues, or uh, for a long time, racial animus was used to derail that conversation in much of the South, if not the country. Um, uh, that, that's really the interrupter of that conversation and what uh, is difficult sometimes to fight back against because you have to get the attention of enough of us to put us back on track and say, well, those matter to some extent, but what's really at stake here is these more important wider issues. Um, and the rest is trying to keep us from talking about that. Really um, well said. Uh, also, I want to say uh, we, we uh, not only have a uh, mention, Anthony Fauci, uh, but that chapter is about civil servants. We dedicate the book uh, to America's uh, civil servants. Um, if, as we try to show in the book, um, we believe that there is a long record of government making the country better, um, not perfect, better in terms of our values, um, then that didn't happen without the civil servants. Um, it's not the leaders that make that happen. There has to be an army behind them that makes that happen. And um, for all the denigration of civil service and the bureaucratic bashing, the historical record is the exact opposite. You have beautifully anticipated one of my later questions um, and answered it nicely. So I was going to ask about that wonderful dedication. I, I was grateful for it. In fact, over the last few days, as I've been rereading your book, I've also been reading Fauci's just out um, memoir slash civil service um, pay in. And it's really wonderful to see. Um, there's so many terrific reconstructions of history throughout this book and readers um, on this webinar and those beyond will really have fun with the multitude of ways in which um, history comes alive again. I wanna take just one of those pivotal moments. Back in the 60s, you very brilliantly juxtaposed the Port Huron Statement and the Chicago School. Today's narrative, Chicago School won, Port Huron Statementers lost. Yours is a much more complex story and I wonder if you'd talk about how you think about that contest for so it was and its aftermath in terms of the government market mix. Well, let me Joe, you I, again, you might want to describe what the Port Huron statement is, uh, if not the Chicago school, but please take that question. Oh, well, the Pure Port Huron statement was the founding document for the students for a democratic society, which today to many years sounds like some type of really wild outlying <laughs> radical group read the statement i mean it is anodyne in many respects mm -hmm. uh and it's particularly anodyne uh and i think we say this in the book sid in comparison to justice powell uh writes a memorandum to the chamber of commerce just before he's put on the supreme court uh, that rails against the attacks on business. Uh, that movement, uh, that together with the Chicago School of Economics, is really uh, sort of uh, extent today in many, many ways, uh, not the least of which is one of the things that came out of the PAL memorandum uh, was the funding of institutions like the Heritage Society, which, by the way, is taking the lead role in drafting up a plan for the next Republican administration called Project 2025. It is a remarkable document. Uh, it is more radical than anything I've ever read, uh, which would lead not only to the deconstruction of the administrative state, but would re re leads to an authoritarian regime, not the least of which is to have the complete political control over the civil service. Not, it's not complete. I might have overstated it, but significant political troll more than we've ever seen in, in the history of the country. Uh, so no, uh, Rogan, uh, the, the 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 genesis of uh, the uh, uh, the economics on the right has been a long time coming. 
uh, and now we're seeing it's it's uh, apotheosis, I would say. Is it anything to add, or I captured it? I think Joe nailed it. Wonderful. I'm visualizing a future edition of this book, and may there be many, 30 years from now, looking back at the moment when the Heritage Foundation blueprint for a new administration is juxtaposed to the Green New Deal. And we see which one won, so to speak. Uh, good both, analogy. Good analogy. You were both distinguished law professors. And we live in an era where the courts, for the last 30 years or so, seem to be our chief arbiters of national policy, a whole lot of policy making, including and maybe primarily around this mix of government and market and markets, comes to the courts. Yet across this book, the Supreme Court really is Alexander Hamilton's least dangerous branch. To go empirical on you for a moment, across this book, you mentioned the Supreme Court 83 times. It doesn't really become central to the book until chapter 11, where in contemporary times, a chapter eyebrow-raisingly called Mitch McConnell's America, Congress is mentioned well over 200 times, three times as many as our various presidents. So the executive branch and Congress, in your reconstruction of this mix of government and markets and how we got there, play much bigger roles as institution than do the court, particularly the Supreme Court. Was that deliberate? Does it surprise you? It seemed out of step with how we think again about who makes policy now. I'm just curious if you ruminate on how two law professors took the courts and put them in the back seat. Dude, go ahead. Um, so, and the way we have talked about uh, the history of the country, um, the court is anti-democratic. Uh, we have these debates, uh, they go on for a long time, there's much dithering uh, here and there uh, over the mix, uh, but gradually uh, we come to these decisions uh, about the mix. Um, the Supreme Court uh, sits there and uh, its interpretation of the Constitution um, affects the scope of that debate and what we can change and can't change. Um, and over the years, that's the role the uh, Supreme Court has changed. Um, at times, uh, it can be terribly intrusive. Uh, it blocked uh, Roosevelt's attempts uh, at the New Deal for a while. Um, it aided and abetted uh, racial segregation and Jim Crow in this country forever, um, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't show up, uh, it shows up as one or two decisions, but has profound impact on our history. Um, but by and large, um, it has limited itself uh, to protect intervening when democracy goes awry and starts beating up on people who can't be part of the political process, who are marginalized, uh, who um, First Amendment, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and um, as part of that um, plan, sort of conservative plan that we were just talking about, um, um, conservatives saw a bolder role for the court um, to start protecting markets from government intervention. Um, and that's been um, the recent change uh, that caused us to make more mention of the Supreme Court uh, re in recent times. Um, and then, of course, we have the court packing by Mitch McConnell, and hence mm -hmm. the name of the chapter about the court is Mitch McConnell's uh, Supreme Court. Yeah, I uh, the the other thing, uh, Rogan, in terms of uh, do we pay more attention to the legislature than the court? I want you to think about uh, how the court has paid attention and deference to legislature. If you go back to our early uh, uh, 18th century and you look at the Marshall Court, some of the decisions that we discussed were the court saying, you know, Congress, you've got it right. You know, we're going to defer to you. You yeah. want to create national markets. You want the United States to play an important role in, in the uh, uh, transatlantic trade, for example. We're going to support that. The same thing happens during the New Deal, where the court eventually defers to Congress. It happens during the Great Society, where the court eventually agrees with the legislation that came out of uh, uh, LBJ's administrations. And so you do have this idea of deference. 
There are times when the court has decided, no, we're not going to defer. In fact, we are going to say what policy ought to be. Mm -hmm. The glare, glaring example being the, the Lochner era and the people who criticize uh, that period. And quite frankly, as Sid has uh, said today, we're seeing a court uh, playing much more role as policymaker than I think we've seen in our in our lifetimes. I think that's right, too. And it's what uh, struck me about the balance that you um, develop here for really wonderfully well thought reasons. Thanks for articulating that. Um, we've got questions coming in from some of our webinar watchers. I've got a couple more first, and then we'll turn to you guys. Um, one, I, Joe mentioned this earlier, but I've um, long loved your previous book together, um, Achieving Democracy, about, as Joe said, the future of progressive reform in this country, written at a hopeful moment, um, as Joe also said, back in 2014. I'm just curious, as you distinguished authors look back on that previous work, are the last 10 years a detour from this Achieving Democracy and some imperfect but at least literally improving way? Or has the last 10 years since your book came out represented a real long-term setback? Just a top of the head kind of sense. Um, I think there's a tendency um, to measure this by what's going on at the moment. Um, and um, um, over the arc of our history, um, there have been periods where there's been less activist government um, there have been periods where we've had a lot of government introduced, um, but um, most of that is still there, that the decisions we made about protecting markets, uh, helping people about so the need for social welfare, um, we really didn't reverse that. Um, it's sort of like climate change is going in one direction, uh, although the day-to-day -day variations, uh, as I sit here in Swelter in London, uh, can, can be great. Um, and uh, so uh, the last 10 years, uh, we haven't seen a lot of enthusiasm for government. But in the meantime, that invisible government, that submerged government, um, has been going on and doing its thing. Um, and the mix really has remained remarkably similar in terms of having both its significance of markets and government uh, since we founded the country. Uh, Rogan, earlier you said when we write our next book, <laughs> maybe that's the topic, and that is what's happened during the last 10 years. Has it been a detour or a sideshow? Uh, and as Sid was speaking, I don't have a, a better answer than that uh, or an elaboration, but I do have a, a question that, the, that your question raises in my mind is, I wonder if a lot of what we're seeing in the press and even to come out of the court isn't about the mix as much as it is about culture wars. Mm. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, to me, I'm going to have to ponder it a little bit more. I'll use that as a springboard to a last question from me before we turn to those that are coming in um, in the Q&A box. And let me quickly say that any other uh, webinar attendees who've got questions, um, please use that Q&A box and I'll ring them out in a moment. Your book concludes on a hopeful note, which I found very gratifying. Your hope is that, quote, readers can turn the national conversation back to what combination of government and markets will best serve the country. Sid mentioned that equally eloqu eloquently up front. It may just be a moment, but we are at a moment that is regularly described, not in terms of national conversations among readers of serious books, but hyperpolarized, dysfunctional, crisis of democracy. Now, one of your six lessons about American democracy is that employing the government to be true to America's values has never been easy. Accepting that it's gonna be hard road, what could possibly help return us from this pit we seem to have fallen into, into a style where we have national conversations about what combination of government markets will best serve the country. Because well, we've have... done it before. There you Sorry, go. Joe, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, um, that, that was one of the sort of reassuring things to us as we looked at the arc of history um, that um, uh, tumultuous times are nothing new. <laughs> Polarization is nothing new. Um, the 60s, if nothing, um, 
was far more uh, disruptive in many ways and certainly far more violent um, than anything uh, we're experiencing now. Um, and we got through it um, and we got change was made uh, because all that disruption returned us to the conversation about what kind of country um, we want to be in. Um, that could take a while. Um, first, deciding on what the mix is, mm -hmm. it's not something people are going to agree about. Um, and you got to work through the normal democratic uh, disagreement. And then you got to get past the disruptors um, who can uh, uh, literally uh, stop us from having that conversation, making the changes that we need. Uh, I completely agree uh, about uh, we've been there before. Uh, I would add one other thing that I hope our book does. Uh, and that is more immediate. And which is to say, this idea of a discussion about mixing government and markets, another way of phrasing it is we're talking about policy. What policy is going to help America? And if we can get away from personalities and sound bites and concentrate on these types of issues, I think conversation can take place. Well, I am encouraged by the idea we've done it before. Um, and I guess also to advert to a point you made in a different context earlier, Joe, if we can't have the conversation, maybe our AI tools can. Um, I'm going to go to the wonderful array of questions that have come in from webinar attendees. I'm going to start with James Goodwin's question, which is an interesting twist on what sometimes gets set up as conservatives, laissez-faire slash libertarian and uh, the opposite on the part of liberals or progressives. He writes, as Project 2025 demonstrates, a project you mentioned earlier, Joe, the effort to lay out a blueprint by the Heritage Foundation for the new Republican administration, many conservatives have abandoned their previous embrace of free market fundamentalism and now actually support a muscular government, albeit, he writes, for horrific ends. Um, oh, the question, the rest of the question just disappeared, um, but I... I, I remember it well enough to say that um, what lessons can we draw from your book for this new, I believe his term he used was author authoritarian turn by today's conservatives? Um, I'd return to the same message. Um, we've, it's happened before. Um, uh, one of the things we stress in the introduction is for good or bad, um, government has um, um, done a lot of bad things to a lot of bad people, um, subjugation of Native Americans, um, the uh, system of Jim Crow, and before that, slavery. Those were all the government doing it in an authoritative manner. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had to overcome that. Um, but we had to overcome it by finally understanding um, that um, it was contrary to our values. Um, uh, the values of the country made it possible for the government to subrogate um, and otherwise uh, act in an authoritarian manner against those peoples. Um, and it was only through um, a long, long conversation in some instances that we came to understand the discrepancy between uh, what we were doing as a people uh, by allowing the government or requiring them to do that um, and, um, and our true national values. So I am, um, I'm thinking about, in response to your question, Organ, I'm thinking about this idea of what uh, conservatives and the economy, uh, and not only that, but how, how does the American populace look at a conservative's view of the economy? So I'll, I'll raise a, a couple of questions. How much privatization can America really tolerate? How much privatization of our schools? Do we really want to uh, privatize Social Security? No. Do we really want to privatize health care? No. Uh, and I think that is you, you can be as conservative as you like about the economy, but when it veers over to uh, the moneyed interest taking over more and more of it, I think you're going to see pushback from the American public. And in some cases we are. Um, a related question came in from webinar attendee John Harms, who asks, in a similar vein, but interested to hear you all address this aspect of the what we might call the hypocrisy of um, some folks in government, or in politics at least. Isn't it the case, John writes, 
But those who complain about activist government are often complaining about specific policies and big government is just a convenient straw man or straw person. How else can you explain the same people complaining about the deep state advocating, advocating for a border wall and using the military to prevent immigration? Um, I, I, I've tried to find this recently and I couldn't, but it's there. Um, there were two political scientists uh, who uh, uh, re once remarked, never uh, underestimate um, the capacity of the American public to hold two contradictory ideas at once. Um, um, many of our fellow citizens are busy. Um, they have lives to live and jobs to uh, support their family. And um, unlike uh, probably everyone on this uh, call and in the webinar, um, they don't spend a lot of time trying to think consistently about government. Um, and uh, so that that's not surprising. Um, and in a way, it sort of supports our thesis that uh, it is government, after all, that makes all these decisions about how to shape the country. Um, and sometimes those decisions, as my last answer indicated, can be terribly unfortunate uh, in hindsight, if not at the time. Um, but that's the way it works. Yeah, I, I, uh, this, I, I agree with that. It's not hard to have both ideas. The government's too big and too small at the same time. Uh, I want to go back uh, to uh, Madison uh, for a moment. Uh, you know, Madison's brilliant essay, Federalist Number 10, talks about the, the conflicts that we have of private interest groups wanting to get what they want for themselves. It's always been with us. It's not going to go away. And that's, that's, I think, part of Madison's genius in that, in that essay. Let's, let's try to proliferate interests. The problem we have now is that some interests have more money and more voice than others, and we have to figure out ways of ameliorating the power of that, that money really plays in our politics. So that's, that's part of the problem. I want to go back to something else I said about conflicting interests. Uh, for me, and I think the the one of the theses of the book is, one way of figuring out which of those conflicting interests ought to be preferred over the other is to answer the question, does it further the values that we've been talking about? Uh, if it retards them, if it makes uh, people economically uh, unequal, if it disadvantages certain groups, that's probably not a good policy position to advocate for. That kind of approach returning us to a, what will inevitably be a debate over values does sound like the kind of national conversation you all call for in the book, which is refreshing to imagine that pathway even in a disputatious fashion. Um, other interesting questions coming in, this from Alice Caswan. Sorry, Alice, if I said your last name slightly wrong. Um, and this relates to a thought we were a, a pre-call discussion we were having, but Alice asks, Fabulous law professors, prepare. To what degree will West Virginia v. EPA hobble the government given the inability of Congress to provide the kinds of clear statements that the court may require before government can take meaningful actions? Uh, Alice, Alice, you can ask that answer that question better than us. Uh, <laughs> but I have a sneaky suspicion that the major questions doctrine is what you're referring to in, in the West Virginia case, where the court says we have better ideas about policy than Congress. My guess is it's going to be selectively used and it's going to be largely used against environmental initiatives. Same said. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I think Joe's answer earlier about um, uh, the court plays a unique and interesting role in our history. Um, as this anti-democratic uh, institution. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're stuck for the moment. Um, and uh, we have to think about creating uh, and being clever and being activist about how we offset that um, in other ways. The same answer uh, for uh, the money that is flooding the system. Um, um, it is what it is. Um, and. Um, the question is uh, for people that are see this as an undesirable thing. Uh, well, uh, OK, what can we do within the limits and choices available to us? Uh, but our guide star remains uh, those values. It's making the argument how 
those things are against our values and building public support for doing what we can. I want to amend my answer. I said it's going to be used against the environment. I meant against consumers and labor as well. Mm. That is a um, even more depressing amendment, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, really great questions from our webinar attendees. Thanks to you all. Continue. Um, and these last two, if indeed they're the last two, are going to um, raise the ante on, um, in this case, your dedication, and then the next question will be on your conclusion. You have this wonderful dedication, as Sid adverted to, and as I thought to ask about to civil servants. Stephen Brewer writes, Project 2025 would have Trump fire most civil servants to be replaced with partisan workers. Any danger in that? Rhetorical <laughs> question, but have at it. <laughs> uh, we're, back yeah, before, just, we're back before the Pendleton Act. Uh, <laughs> I just wrote a, um, a blog slash op-ed, uh, which uh, hopefully we can get published. Um, and um, as, as our one in this book, um, I used a historical comparison. Um, so um, when uh, Andrew Jackson uh, took over from the Federalists, he fired half of the civil servants in the government. There weren't nearly as many. Um, and he put in what is commonly known as the spoil system, uh, which is the loyal members of his political party to uh, run the government. Um, and uh, the Jacksonians, who were in power for some time, uh, basically continued that system for a, a long time. Uh, there were two results. One, um, the incompetence of government uh, became overwhelming to the point that uh, Jackson himself and his successors had to reestablish some sort of merit uh, selection system for at least some of government because the post office didn't run. There are things that people expected government to do and they had to abandon the spoil system when it came to those. The second was just mass corruption. Um, and uh, um, I think we would see basically history repeating itself. The corruption would be different. Um, uh, then it was that uh, civil servants had to give political donations to keep their job. They, that's not gonna happen, but there are other kinds of corruption that I think that can only lead to. The other thing that uh, other than uh, fooling around with Schedule F, which is the power to to uh, get rid of civil servants, that Project 2025 does is it creates a whole system of application, hiring lists, and training. I like to call it grooming, uh, the grooming of the right uh, for the civil service. And I want to, uh, I want to consider one thing. Let's assume that Trump is elected. Let's assume Project 25 is adopted in toto. Let's assume that now we have a bureaucracy under control of the White House. Four years later, what if we have a radical shift to the left? Now we're going to have to redo government, get rid of everything happened, and put in our guys, literally, right? And so then four years later, eight years later, a shift to the right. Basically, what Project 2025 uh, does by uh, de de uh, destabilizing uh, the civil service is to really create a chaotic form of government that's going to go ba whipsaw back and forth. It's not going to be good. It's going to be destabilizing for the economy, let alone for the American psyche. So I, I find that the dangers of 2025 relative to the civil service are pronounced. And mischievously take out of that uh, really both your um, wonderful, um, thoughtful responses, the observation that what that sounds a lot like is parliamentary government or wait for it, the Heritage Foundation will bring us European style socialism <laughs> on a national level. Incredible. <laughs> Sid referred earlier to sweltering in his office um, there in London. Um, and I know it's been hot across all the United States as well. And, an anonymous attendee has posed a question that um, may strain your book's conclusions to its very limits. Um, a wonderful mix, you, um, or, or a, a mix in any case, sometimes wonderful, sometimes not, has been the characteristic of, um, of our government and markets-based system across our 230 plus years as a nation. Climate change, poses the kind of problem that is going to be very hard to carbon market and government rule our way out of. 
anything in the book that can help us understand the path to slowing and even reversing the, the questioner asks climate change. I'm going to go on slowing <laughs> yeah, because I because I think that the the future for uh, climate change is a perfect example of what our book is talking about, and that is a partnership between government and the private sector in order to address this. And uh, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, Biden's uh, uh, legislation, the IRA legislation, does provide clean energy funding and clean energy initiatives and uh, financial incentives to do that uh, in order to stimulate the private sector. I said slowing because I don't think it's enough, but I think it's the right approach. It is a challenge. Um, one likes of which I'm not sure we ever saw, except for perhaps the world wars. Um, right. And um, um, those of us who are activists need to recruit more activists and more of us have to be active. It's a lovely um, sort of uh, paraphrase really of that, how Sid just put it, of the conclusion of the work. Um, and in a way, the questioner anticipated where these two remarkable authors land us, I would say both in their previous work and this one, passively expecting markets to operate in some magical, unseen, invisible hand way to fix our problems, and passively awaiting some kind of government savior to strong woman or strong man, her or his way to um, some desired future has never been successful in the United States, and one could argue never been successful anywhere, really. Instead, what this book ultimately, and their previous work, which I also recommend to webinar attendees, does in a very compelling way, is call us, we the people, we the citizens, to engage in the kind of conversation, and, and that can be a form of activism, that enables us to rebalance government and markets in a way that encourages this ongoing national experiment to continue. Profound thanks to these two extraordinary authors for taking the time to create this wonderful book that will be out, um, well, already seems to be. There's a link in the chat area to the book on Amazon. A couple of you have already used it. Also, let me just note as you depart, Click on those chat um, links to various op-eds. Uh, this and the way that books ought to be um, done has, is anticipated by a whole slew of serious, thoughtful capsule summaries of their argument. It will enable you to navigate this wonderful work with even more detail. Let me again thank the Center for Progressive Reform and heartfelt embrace and thanks to Joe Tomain and Sid Shapiro, who have created a remarkable book that deserves to be widely taught and read. Um, I can happily say that Amazon is delivering it to Italy. <laughs> thanks all. Thank you, Robert. We'll give Sid and Joe the final word. Thanks to everyone who um, came aboard to learn a little more about our book. We appreciate your interest. Rogan, thank you so much for your 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 questions and your compliments. Uh, you've encouraged me to read the book. <laughs> well said. We're going to close now, and um, with thanks again to all.